Good evening, everybody. Welcome again, all of you, to another evening at his feet, as we have spent the last few weeks of this London uh, season hearing God's word from multiple men of God. It just reiterates the love that you have shown for all of us. It's all about you. It's all about your sacrifice. It's all about your love. It's all about your blessed assurance, the season that we are preparing ourselves. So as we spend some time today preparing our hearts and minds to hear God's word through Dr. Naveen, we pray that uh, God would speak to us, that our hearts would be fertile enough to hear his word. We commit each one of us, shall we pray and begin this session. Father, we thank you. We thank you, Lord, for everybody who has come today. Everybody who has come today with an expectant heart that you would speak to each one of us, Lord. We pray for the word that Dr. Nabin is going to bring. We know, Lord, that you have put these words in his heart and it's you who are speaking to each one of us through him. We pray that our hearts would be like fertile soil, that we would be able to hear and these words would bear fruit to our lives. Let it not be another day or evening where we hear God's good word and feel good about it. But let it be a day where we introspect and see how we can, through our lives, be a blessing to others. We come at this evening, Lord, in your hands. We pray that you speak to each one of us, Lord. May it be a wonderful evening. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. John chapter 8, verses 27 to 30. They did not understand that he was telling them about his father. So Jesus said, when you have lifted up the son of man, then you will know that I am he and that I do nothing on my own, but speak just what the father has taught me. The one who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do what pleases him. Even as he spoke, many believed in him. Amen. Let me introduce Dr. Naveen. He has been with us for the last two days. He needs no introduction. Nevertheless, I take this opportunity, sir, to give a brief background about you. Dr. Naveen Thomas is one of the most senior surgeons at the Bangalore Baptist Hospital with vast experience in the discipline of surgery. He has over 26 years of experience in general surgery and 20 years in pediatric surgery. Dr. Naveen's past experience includes working as a senior tutor in surgery at CMC Valour from 1998 to 99 and as a fellow in pediatrics transplantation at Children's Hospital at Westmead, Sydney, 2009 to 2011, and as a clinical associate lecturer, Sydney Medical School at the same time. Most recently, Dr. Naveen was the director of Baptist Hospital. But more than everything else, Dr. Naveen is a man of God who is the embodiment of compassion and empathy, and we are blessed to have you, sir, with us today and for the next two days. Over to you, sir. We look forward to hearing you from you. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I feel like Zachariah in Luke chapter one, who lost his voice. <laughs> yeah, as I was saying, it has finally cracked. So, um, it's it's so good to connect. Am I am I audible? Is it is it okay? 
So, uh, okay. yes, Thank yes, you. Thank you. Yeah. So there was this son who comes back home <clears throat> and tells his father, Oh, dad, there is a small get together at school tomorrow. And the father says, <clears throat> small get together. How small? He says, dad, it's only you, me, and the principal. Yeah, today we have a, we have a wonderful get together. And, uh, and may our hearts be ready to receive um, what he has to tell us. Because it doesn't really matter what or who the vehicle is. He can use a donkey, but as long as it is his word and our hearts are ready, he can minister to us. So we receive that in faith. In John chapter 6, we found that there was the shadow of the cross. Bread is to be broken. Bread is to be received and appropriated. Bread is to be shared. In the next chapter 7, we saw Jesus giving that clarion call and invitation. If anyone is thirsty, let him. What an invitation. The one who said, I thirst, <clears throat> is the one who invited people to come and drink so that the living waters could flow out of his heart. We also saw Nicodemus and the transformation. Today we'll move on and look at the shadow of the cross in John chapter 8. It was already beautifully read to us. And it says, as Jesus was expounding, telling them about the Father, they did not understand. <clears throat> so he said, when you have lifted up the Son of Man, you will know that I am he. What a statement to make. By the time it came to John chapter 8, the temple was building up. The opposition was being galvanized. They were slowly coming to the conclusion they had to get rid of this new rabbi on the horizon. It would finally culminate in them wringing their hands in frustration. In John chapter 12 and verse 18 says that is also why the crowd went out to meet him. This is in the context of Lazarus because they heard that he had performed this sign. Then Pharisees said to one another, you can see that this is doing us no good. Look how the world has gone after him. So they are really frustrated. They are coming to the conclusion. They have to get rid of this man. Well, there were multiple attempts to trap Jesus. And the whole portion starts with that. The woman caught in adultery was a foolproof attempt. Either way, they knew they had trapped Jesus. If he said, leave her alone, he would immediately be accused. He advised to break the Mosaic law. There would be dozens of witnesses, more than enough. Well, if he had said, stone her, such a cruel man, he talked about mercy, he talked about all this, but look at what he really is. One is reminded of, uh, should you pay taxes to Caesar or not? If no, it would be against the Roman emperor. Collecting taxes was one thing they all cared about. Jesus could be reported. If he said yes, they would accuse him. They could accuse him of advising, you know, connivance with the Romans. So it's mentioned in Matthew 22, Mark 12, Luke 20, again and again and again. You know, they all report this. 
Render to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. Unto God what belongs to God. What an answer. What an answer. Well, coming back to the woman caught in adultery. Where was this man? That was another issue. Why was only the woman caught? We don't know what Jesus was writing on the sand. But it was the same finger which wrote the Ten Commandments as the pre-incarnate Christ, as part of the Godhead. It was the same finger which wrote Mene, Mene, Tekel, Uparsin. Same night, it says, King Belshazzar was killed. Darius the Mede took over. It was probably a king called uh, Cytaxeres II, a Mede, who was allowed to hold power for some time by Cyrus the king. Well, it was the same finger which wrote the human genome and every other genome. If someone was to sit and write the code for the human genome very quickly without any break for eight hours a day, it would take 25 years to complete, you know, writing that human genome. Go now, neither do I condemn you, Jesus said when people had left one by one. And sin no more. In another version it says, leave your life of sin. He was affirming her, but not her lifestyle. The only one who could forgive sins was the one to whom she was brought. What a beautiful picture. Well, some of the early manuscripts that we have do not show 753 to 811. And that's why it is put in the italics in some of your Bibles. Well, dear friends, it is good to draw our attention to the lengths to which Bible compilers, you know, the, they have gone to make sure we have an authentic version. Between uh, 1946 to 56, that was the time when the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered in the Qumran caves. Till then, people were questioning about the accuracy. How, how could we be sure that these texts are you know, true to the original? Maybe there are so many changes. Maybe we cannot trust them. But then, you know, this, the big book which was found there was the book of Isaiah, the scroll of Isaiah. Perfectly matched what was there even before Christ. There were people who questioned and said, no, you know, Pontius Pilate, how do we know he was there? You know, was it true at all? It is not really true. It was not at that time. And uh, he, as he was a procurator, he was not a prefect. It is a wrong description in the Bible. All that was going on discussion till Antonio Prova, he was an Italian archaeologist, discovered this limestone plaque, 82 into 65 centimeters, near the place where a theater was built by Herod the Great. Interestingly, so-called, you know, pilot stone, as it became known, that helped us correct the understanding that Yes, Pilate was at that time, exactly at that time. And he was a prefect. You know, so what Tacitus had written was actually wrong. What Bible had shown us was right. Even the title was correct. What was so again and again and again. We can't, we don't have time to go into all those instances where 
biblical records have been proved to be accurate. And it's of no, it doesn't surprise us. It is not because of lack of evidence that people disbelieve. It's because people do not want to believe. You know, someone was asked about, was, about when he questioned all this, do you really want it to be true? He said, to be, to be honest, no, I don't want it to be true because if there is a moral lawgiver, then I'll have to obey that. Very true. And uh, again, this whole passage starts, each went to his own home. Jesus went to Mount of Olives. Very interesting. In Matthew 8 and verse 20, Jesus saith unto them, in King James Version, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has not where to lay his head. We're also reminded of uh, Luke 2 and verse 49. He said to them, his parents, why did you seek me? Did you not know that I must be about my father's business in my father's home? So, gee, everyone went to their own home. Jesus goes to the Mount of Olives to confer with his father. Jesus says, when you have lifted up the Son of Man, you will know that I am He. Much of the discussion, the back and forth conversation, revolves around Abraham, the patriarch Abraham, which the Jews claimed as their own. They rejoiced, and he says, your father Abraham rejoiced at the thought of seeing my day. They are flabbergasted. They say, oh, now we know that you are a little off, you, that you are demon-possessed. Abraham died, so did the prophets. Yet do you say, whoever obeys your word will never taste death. Are you greater than your father Abraham? He died, so did the prophets. Who do you think you are? Who do you think you are? Asking the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Jesus replied, if I, you know, glorify myself, my glory means nothing. My Father, whom you claim as your God, is the one who glorifies me. Your father Abraham rejoiced at the thought of seeing my day. Then, the questioning continues. You are not even 50 years old. You have seen Abraham. Then the climax says, Very truly, I tell you, Jesus answered, Before Abraham was, I am. That was it. That was it. At that, they picked up stones to stone him. You can picture this. Exodus 3 and verse 14. I am who I am. You know, it's the tetragrammaton, Yahweh, Y-W, Y-H-W-H. If you ask a devout Jew, can you help me? Can you pronounce this? He would say, oh, I know you're going to trick me. I cannot. He, he, they wouldn't even utter that word. Imagine Moses' plight. He was expected to go back and tell his wife, his father-in-law, and later the Israelites, that he had seen a talking bush. Really? Yes, the bush was on fire. Really? <laughs> and the bush was not getting consumed. It was God. He spoke to me. Really? What did he say his name was? He said his name was I am. Can you picture that? 
And uh, Jesus says, when you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am He. The great I am hung on the cross. Well, nothing else would do. Nothing else would suffice. There was this slave uh, from the, uh, you know, a black slave who was being watched by his master. This was centuries ago. And this black slave who was a very devout man. You now they, the person watched him go out near the fence. He held two poles, sticks in the uh, shape of a cross and he was saying something. And he tiptoed and listened to it. They said, enough for me, enough for justice, enough for God. Because he was the blameless one. It was enough for God. Enough for justice and that's enough for me. That's why when he had paid the price, Jesus could shout and say, Tetelestai, it is finished. Not I am finished. It is finished. It's been paid. Paid in full. It's over. I have done it. I have done the Father's will. And the Father turned his face away. The darkness covered the earth. What a picture. And when I am raised up, lifted up, he draws all men unto himself. As we finish, while before we finish, we look at these two types of sinners. One is the overt sinner, as this lady who was caught and the covert sinners as the people who brought her. Two responses to conviction of sin. Isn't that true? One moved away from Christ. The Pharisees, they had become more bitter, maybe more angry. They were convicted, but they became more hard. The other embraced the forgiving heart of Christ. The woman received grace, came close, closer to the heart of Christ. Same thing happened on the cross. In dying agony, the one on the right is drawn to his forgiving grace and mercy. He also starts off cursing and questioning. But then he says, don't you see we are suffering this because of our, what we have done. We deserve this. But this man did no sin. Lord, please remember me. Please remember me when you come in your kingdom. And what, a, what, a, what an amount of grace and mercy poured out. Today you shall be with me in paradise. What, what a turnaround. So it can harden, it can soften. Responses can be so different. Even at that point in time. So when we listen to God's word, may we just respond and say, Lord, I want my heart to be softened. I want to respond. I want to hold on. I want to obey. And God gives us grace, much grace, much strength. The things around us are changing and rapidly changing. Challenges are you know, growing and in different fashions and manner. But then we come into him and say, Lord, I want my will, my resolve to follow you, to become even stronger as I come close to your cross, your heart, your bosom. Shall we just bow down?
Heavenly Father, we thank you, we worship you. You know the prayer in each heart tonight. You know the tear, you know the fear. Thank you for your grace, much grace. Thank you for mercy that we find on the cross. We want to respond. We want to come close to you because only there we find strength to follow. Let your presence, sense of your presence, be with us. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Dr. Naveen, for that wonderful word. Obviously, inspired, God inspired word. What caught my attention was about the two words that you talked about the sinners, overt and covert sinners. And it, today, we, as Dr. Naveen uh, prayed, let us be, I'd rather be an overt sinner who embraces. God's forgiveness and resolves to follow him amidst all our weaknesses than be like the righteous person who brings sinners into for judgment. So may the God, good God, give us grace as we uh, depart today. Help us to have a good night's rest. Help us to be humble. Help us to embrace God's forgiveness. Uh, please share uh, these uh, lovely evenings to your friends and invite more people to come and join and hear God's word and be blessed, encouraged, so that we can be a testimony, we can live a fruitful life for his glory. Thank you all for joining. Thank you, Dr. Naveen. Look forward to hearing from you again tomorrow. And may God bless each one of us. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Thank you.